Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Good morning, Tyson. How are you? Uh, good to see you. I, I'm doing well. Uh, it's good to see you as well. It's been a very long week for me, I can tell you. I've, I've had a my wife has been sick. My son has been sick. It has been, I've been trying to keep everybody separate and work and keep everything together. So, um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a rough week, but we're getting through it. Everyone's starting, they're on the, they're, they've turned the corner. So uh, we're, we're in good shape. Yeah, that's good. We just finished, we just had dinner with our sons the night before last. And that was the first time we basically saw them for a week because they both had Omicron. So yeah, for sure. It's, it's good to be getting back in the swing of things. And it was funny to hear laughter around the dinner table. Yeah, no, no, no question. Um, so we, we didn't have much laughter last night, but it's this morning. It was people, you know, waking up saying I, I'm feeling a lot better. So that's, that's what I, I, I feel very good about. So that's great. Right. So you want to go ahead and introduce our awesome guest? Yes. Our awesome guest is Jane Muir. Uh, and I honestly don't even know if I've ever said that name right, but uh, hopefully I, I do. So that's good. She's, good. She's shaking her head. Yes. So uh, who is a Gildian, but also a Florida attorney whose practice area focuses on business transactions and litigation, a sixth generation attorney and fourth generation resident of Miami. She grew up working for her father's firm and has done every job in a law firm. I'm not going to do the full bio because that's pretty awesome by itself. Jane, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be invited. Well, it's long overdue. We should have had you a long time ago and I was going over the list of people that we wanted to have on. And I was surprised that we hadn't had you on before just because we've talked so much. But one of the things I liked in your bio is that you've done every job in your law firm. Talk to us about that because that'll probably help us flesh out your story. Sure. Well, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not very creative. I went into the family business. We're all lawyers. My mom is a circuit judge um, where she was, she just retired at the end of 2020, but for 35 years, she was a judge. Um, my dad is a practicing attorney and going all the way back to, you know, the American Revolution, all my ancestors on my dad's side were attorneys. Um, so growing up, if I wanted extra money, I had to go work. And I started 10 years old going to my dad's office and filing papers for him and as I got older, they gave me bigger jobs. Like I ran the switchboard. I was a receptionist and I would answer the call, you know, um, good morning, Dunwoody White and Landon. How may I help you? One moment, please. And route the, the calls. Uh, I became, during law school, I was a paralegal and I would help them with the things like billing or assembling um tax returns and things. My dad is an estate planning attorney. Um, so growing up before I passed the bar, I, I did every job in a law firm. And then I, I passed the bar and be, joined a small personal injury firm in Miami. And I, I got let go after six months and that was the bottom of the market. So there were no jobs. And my trial partner from law school had also been let go of his job and so we figured why not start a firm and we just didn't have any clue how to practice law or run a firm it was just uh, we were just doing our best reading we read that book by Jay Foonberg how to start and build your law practice um, but after about a year he had to get a real job because we just weren't um, doing well enough. But he went to the public defender's office and I've, I've just kept going along. You are the second person to mention that book in two episodes. So Brooks mentioned it on the last episode. So it's it's a legendary book. I mean, I think everybody or most people know about it for sure. I, I wonder, I mean, to me, sixth generation attorney, I, I it's hard for me to even fathom, right? So being a sixth generation attorney, do you, have, did you find it difficult to make your own way? Did you feel like you were, you had to do what the people before you did, family members before you did, or did you say, hey, I want to do this and I'm going to, I'm going to blaze my own path? Well, my 
parents, um, my dad really encouraged me to go on my own because he followed the golden path. He, he was in the army and then he went to law school. And so he graduated older and he had worked for Florida Power and Light and they were grooming him for management. So he decided to go to law school instead of get an MBA because he thought that would give him more flexibility. If they let him go at Florida Power and Light, he could hang a shingle. But instead, they, they got him hired at this very um, venerated law firm at the time called Steel Hector and Davis. And they said, this new baby lawyer is our number one guy, so you have to hire him. So uh, dad had gone in that direction, like big law, and he did not have a great experience. There were a few times along the way when he got politically screwed and he just thought, you know, it's better to have your own practice where you have the control and you have the flexibility and um, you can bring in your own clients and, uh, and, and run your own practice. So he, he really encouraged me in this direction because I was really scared at the beginning. Like, I, I didn't think I was going to make it. I would, I would like... I had maybe three clients and I would tell myself, okay, Jane, you can watch one episode of Sex in the City and then you have to go figure out what to do for this client. And it was like an anxiety thing. I was like, I, I, they're going to come and take my bar card any second. <laughs> but, um, you know, I got tougher. I think it's like a muscle that the risk tolerance that you have to have to be a, a lawyer with your own firm is it, you just get stronger and like little by little things kind of level out you start to feel the flow of of how money comes in like I know that January is usually slow and uh, like the summer is usually slow but then there are peaks around you know June and September typically so you you just start to feel stronger more confident and I think that my, my family's influence really made me focus primarily on being the best lawyer I could be. And I'm really just now starting to focus on being a better law firm owner. Well, I definitely want to hear about your law firm setup. And, and I know we've, we've had a long history together talking on the phone. I remember talking and walking and those kinds of things, but I did, I did want to ask you one question. So as a household of lawyers, my wife and I, as you know, practice together, we have kids and they, they certainly know the names of all the immigration forms. They know about motions to dismiss. They know these things. I, I'm wondering what advice do you have for us as the parent, as lawyer parents? Like what advice do you have for us about talking about the law or about like, what was it like to sit there growing up with your mom and judge and your dad in private practice? Um, you know, they were very orderly. Like we had a routine that was extremely predictable. Every night, seven o'clock Star Trek, eight o'clock story hour, nine o'clock bed. Uh, <laughs> so of course I'm a big sci-fi nerd. And we had breakfast every Saturday as a family. We went to church every Sunday as a family. And it was just like orderly and predictable. And I think that helps a lot. I think it makes you feel really good. And, and I strive to be like that. And it's kind of an atomic habit, you know, like you spend time with your family um, in, in that kind of regular schedule, uh, then everything works out. So tell me a little bit about the 10 things to do to become preeminent in your field. What, where did you, where did you come up with this topic? Well, when I first started practicing, I was at this firm. Uh, I wasn't very happy and I was trying to like get my head straight because I felt like for the first time I didn't have an end in sight. Like every, everything you do up until you finish law school, it's three years, four years, you know, high school's four years, college four years, law school's three years. And so even if you hate what you're doing, there's an end in sight and you just have to kind of slog through. 
so I was feeling like not that psyched about my, my job. And I really was looking for something to help me face the future, which was a 50 year law career where I was going to just be doing the same damn thing for 50 years and no end in sight. So I was kind of blue about that. And uh, so I came across an article which had the 10 things to do to become preeminent in your field. And I followed this advice and it has made me very successful in my market. Um, so the, the 10 things are make a logo, make a website, make business cards, go to events, talk about what you do, follow up with the people you meet, speak, write, um, get board certified and become a leader in an organization in your, in your area. Uh, and I, I was like, this is perfect. This is the checklist right here. So I'm going to just do all these things to the max. So, um, so that's what I did. And I've been published like dozens of times and I've given dozens and dozens of lectures and seminars on all kinds of topics. Typically I'll find something novel, like something that just changed, like the payroll protection loans. When they came out, I, bam, I write an article about it and I submit it to the local business newspaper, the, the daily business review or, um, you know, something changes in the law. Like there's a new change to the Fair Labor Standards Act that enables a private cause of action for tip theft. And so, boom, I'll like research that and write an article about it. So I always like to share that as my um, professional development advice because it's been super helpful to me. Of every lawyer I know, especially those in small private practice. I don't know anyone who's been involved in the bar as much as you. Talk to us about how that's worked for you as far as referrals go, networking and all those kinds of things. What tips do you have for people as far as getting involved in their local bar? Sure. Well, um, so Miami-Dade County has 19,000 lawyers and the county bar is the voice of all of those lawyers. Um, and I got involved with that because it was advice from my family, really. They said, you know, you need to meet other lawyers because they will, they will be the ones that are asked about you by Martindale Hubble so you can get AV rated. And, you know, that's the granddaddy of all ratings and, and stuff like that. So they felt that that was a high priority. So I got involved in the county bar right out of law school. Um, and I just threw myself in every committee that I was part of. Like I was on the newspaper committee. I overhauled the newspaper redesign, change the whole procedure so that you could upload your articles and not have to email them and assigning out editorial jobs, things like that. And then I did the website and then I did, so all these things in the county bar for me have been sort of eight, um, like a sandbox to experiment with things I want to do in my firm. Um, so it's, it, tremendous for that purpose. It's been tremendous for corporate governance education. Um, it's been just a great way for me to gain experience and grow my practice because whenever anybody thinks of a commercial litigation, uh, a lot of times they think of me because I'm top of mind because I was, I published an article or I ran into them at a networking event. So after I think it was um, seven years on the board and every year I was on the board, I was on the executive committee because I, I do everything a thousand percent. Um, I, I ran for officer position of treasurer and in our group, you, you sort of rise the ranks like a ladder. Uh, and every single election I ran for executive committee, for officer positions, I was always contested because I think people think that I'm young and, you know, maybe not that smart. <laughs> like, And then I just destroy all my competition in elections because I really put the work in. And, and it's not, um, 
It's a lot like law firm marketing. You know, you, you identify your target audience, which is voting members. And then you identify all the people who you know and you call them and ask them to vote for you and ask their friends to vote for you. And then another um, great uh, tool I used was like email marketing, but you can't blast email 19,000 lawyers or else it's gonna be spam. So I would divide up the list. I, I hired my stepdaughter to divide up the list of voters and divide them by firm. And then I called my best friend at every firm and asked them to email that list and gave them a templated email. So um, that kind of election experience is so valuable and it does bring you business because when you're talking to people, asking them to vote for you, they also want to send you work or, you know, th they think of you and they have work to send. I think, I think that's great because I think a lot of times people wonder, oh, is there is there an ROI on me getting involved with the bar and all these other things? So I think that that's I think that's great to hear and because it's not just about ROI, you know, it's a, it's about you know giving back and it's about you know supporting your bar and everything else. But um, so Mike, I, I want to ask you about you. You're in a very competitive market in Miami, um, and especially with what you do, there's a lot of silk stocking firms that um, you're competing with. So I'm just curious how. How do you differentiate yourself? Um, how, let's say that you know so a business meets with you versus someone else, or one of the silk stocking firms. Like, how do you set yourself apart? I mean, obviously you've done a lot with the bar and everything. That's that's great. Um, but what what is it that you say to these clients that convinces them to to come over to you? Uh, it's a combination of value, client service, and care. And when I say value, the the big firms, they're billing out at like, I think their associates bill at my rate, um, which is 400 an hour. And the average rate in our market is 225. So I'm above average, but I'm below um, big law. And I also don't waste time because I, I have so many cases. I don't. I can't afford to grind a file that that doesn't require attention. You know, it. I have to be really strategic about how we allocate our our time and our resources, and that goes to the client's benefit because we're not um, we're not building up a file. The average litigation for us earns about. Forty thousand dollars in in fees, and we we always start with the calculus whenever we do an intake of how much is at stake, is the defendant collectible, do we have a basis for fees? So I I basically try to talk the client out of litigation at the beginning, and then if they are really seriously. Uh, prepared for the, the possibility that they would not prevail, but they still want to proceed and, and do the best that they can, then it's the client service component, which like I give out my personal cell phone. I am constantly available. I, the people who are nervous Nellies, I hold their hand. I help them feel good. And then finally the results, like I, I never lose. I mean, you can't say that because it's a guarantee and it's not not ethical under the rules of professional conduct. But I either resolve cases favorably or, you know, I don't pick fights. I don't think I can win. And the kind of clients that are attracted to me are the people who want to do things by the book. They want to follow the rules. They want to be fair. They want to be reasonable. Um, but they want to have a big stick, you know, to to be. Uh, powerful and in their in their disputes we're talking with jane muir she's a business litigator member of the maximum lawyer guild and a great member she's always giving good advice to the team and always pumping people up and getting them excited and we greatly appreciate that Jane, uh, talk to us a little bit. I know that you've had a bit of a journey the last year, year and a half, sort of transitioning into a little bit more focus. Talk a little bit, if you would, about maybe things that you struggled with, because I really feel like you've had a breakthrough here, say, the last 
nine or 10 months? Yeah, I, I think that my 10 year goal was to be bar president. And I really did dedicate a, a 30% of my time to bar service. And now I've rededicated that focus to my firm. And also the guild and, and you guys have been such an inspiration. Like every, I listen to all the podcasts. I write down every book you guys suggest. I read all the books. And then I, I really strive to implement all the advice. Like Jim, your Gary Falkowitz intake series. I, I listened to that carefully and wrote all the notes and I scripted my intake accordingly, like just, just like that. And it's been awesome. Uh, and then Tyson, you told me about Zoho and gave me some other great recommendations for, for service providers. And I've adopted Zoho and I'm implementing it and it's going slow, but it's working awesome. It's saving, it's saving me a ton of money in software. Um, so you guys and, and the weekly meetings have been tremendous uh, for my, for my practice. So my next goal i've been stuck at the same revenue mark for like three years and i think that's partly covid um but i also think it's my own uh re refusal to delegate <laughs> maybe and so i'm i'm really striving to take the advice the maximum lawyer minimum time advice and you know amplify the, the clients that I'm getting, focus on the leverage activities. Like Jim, you told me this like uh, over a year ago, I needed to be focusing on the activities that had better leverage. And your speech at the Max Law Con on leveraging like the difference between an asylum case and a citizenship case in hours that you would dedicate, that was a real, um, that really crystallized it for me. Uh, so I'm striving to build things that will enable that kind of leverage, like a course on how to start a business in Miami and things like that, um, so that I can have different uh, work and that they call it elf, elf activities, like easy, lucrative, and fun on the, on the I Love Marketing podcast. So I'm working on elf activities. It's funny. I've not listened to an I Love Marketing uh, episode in a while. Uh, and, and I, you said Elf. I was like, oh man, I've I haven't listened to I Love Marketing for because it's I don't I don't know if it's a I Love Marketing term, but I that's where I've heard it the most is uh, is uh, through there. So easy, lucrative, and fun. So I, I want to. I know we're gonna maybe run a little bit long on time, but the I want to ask you about that. You said you're stuck, and I want to see if maybe we can ask a couple questions to kind of dig a little deeper on that. I, you said, and when you said your rate compared to other firms and you, you're definitely above the market and that's a differentiator, but I wonder if an easy way of raising your revenue is just by tweaking and, and increasing your, your actual hourly rate a little bit. And have you, when's the last time you've adjusted your rate? Last year. Okay. Last year, I, I was at by how much? and I went to 400. Okay, good. So, uh, is the four hundred based upon the three hundred and fifty or the four or the the new number? Is the I don't understand the question. Yeah. So you you said you were stuck at right around I think four hundred. I think is what you said. Is that what you said before? That's my hourly rate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have you seen a significant uptick in your revenue since you since you changed your rate? No, it's been it's been pretty much the same, but. What I think is the issue is my own capacity. So I can only generate so much work out the door and we bill hours. So if I have to divide my time between running the firm and marketing the firm and uh, rainmaking, like they, they say that there's finders, grinders, and minders in the law, right? So I've got to be all three. And that means I can only do a third of of the grinding. So I have a new contract attorney that just joined this month who's going to be helping me grind out more work. So that should double our ability to deliver service. Love it. 
um, I was going to ask you, so what are you going to do next? So you, you've already, you've already, you've already done that. So that's good. Um, yeah. Good. Cause I, th I think that that's what you're going to start doing to, to kind of elevate this thing. I mean, you've got it. You've got the skill set. I mean, you're going to, you're about to just pour the rocket fuel on top <laughs> of it and just take off. I know it. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm, I'm putting the time in, I'm, uh, I'm grinding it out and uh, really striving to apply all the good advice that you guys give. Of those three, finding, minding, and grinding, which do you like the most and which do you like the least? Honestly, I used to think I was a finder more than anything. Like, I want to go to conferences. I want to give lectures. I want to talk to people. I want to go to lunch. Um, but then pandemic, I, I kind of retreated. I've become less of an extrovert. And like, I, I'm an extra, extra, extrovert, 95% extrovert. And uh, nowadays I'm like kind of more selective about how I spend my time and trying to be more targeted because it's, time is feeling a lot more valuable now. So I've, I think I've morphed more into a minder and I love like messing around with the software and, um, you know, tweaking our systems and uh, really trying to develop things that will not require Jane to show up at every networking event. You know what I mean? I love it. Very good stuff. Um, all right. We do need to wrap things up because we've got to be respectful of your time. And we're, I know we're running long here. So uh, I want to remind everyone to go to the big Facebook group and join us. There's a lot of great activity going on there. We got over 5,000 members. Also, if you want a higher level conversation, join us like other guildians uh, in the guild, maxlawguild.com, like Jane. And if you want to go to the conference, we hope you do. Go to maxlawcon2022.com to get your tickets. Jimmy, what's your hack of the week? So uh, a couple weeks ago, I went ahead and got some James O'Hacking III stationery, and I've just been doing one thank you note a day to different people who, uh, a lot of it was for my dad, um, for the, you know, people that donated to the Red Cross and stuff, but I've just been doing one note a day to people, and, and it's just, it makes me feel good, and I know people really like to receive them, so it's something simple. Very good. I love it. Uh, Jane, you're up next. Before I get to yours, though, I did not ask people for a review. So if you will please give us a five-star review, we will greatly appreciate it. it. helps spread the love. But Jane, what is your tip or hack of the week? Okay, my tip is find a college student that lives in your neighborhood and hire them to run errands for you. Uh, I recently hired a young lady who's an architecture student. She's 20. She's got her own car. And she'll take things to Goodwill or, or Amazon returns or pick up wiper blades for my car, like all kinds of little errands. And it's super helpful. So highly recommend. And if you don't have one, uh, like a college kid, then Task Rabbit is a great option. I'm curious, how did you find your, uh, your student or whatever you're calling them? She's my backup pet sitter. So I have a, a very elderly beagle and a, a rescue cat who's missing a leg. His name is Trey. And he, he, so I, we love our pets so much. And whenever we go out of town, we want someone to, to stay with the pets and, and uh, play with them and take care of them. So our main pet sitter had this young lady as backup pet sitter. And she was in our neighborhood. And so we uh, we hired her for errands. Very good. Okay, cool. Because um, I'm just thinking like what, what I would call the person. I mean, per, I guess you could say personal assistant, but. Um, back, backup cat sitter. That's what you call backup cat. Yeah, <laughs> backup cat sitter. I think that'd be a great job post uh, title. So very good. Uh, so my tip is a tip reboot from a long time ago. Uh, a long time ago, I used to use Ring Central. Uh, and we switched to Vonage, and we liked Vonage for a while, um, but then it, we, did, we stopped liking it so much, and we switched back to Ring Central. and Ring Central is so much better than what it was. I mean, it is night and day from whatever I used it last, so if you've not used Ring Central in a while, I highly recommend it. It is so much better than Vonage if you're using Vonage. I, um, 
And there's a lot of other VoIP options out there, but I will tell you, uh, going from Vonage to Ring Central, night and day, um, and it's way different than what it used to be. So highly, highly recommend it. So I use Ring get, Central yeah. too, and Tyson, it it syncs with Zoho. Oh, I know. I, that's why that's why we switched back to it. Um, a big part of it. So it's a uh, it's got it's got so many integrations. It's got so many different options. It just it, it's functionality. It, it's just easy. Its user interface is easy to use. It's great. Um, they should pay us, Jay, to 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 hawk their product. So, I bet they would. Uh, <laughs> I bet they would. So for sure, uh, this podcast sponsored by Ring Central. Uh, but Jane, thank you so much for coming on. A lot of fun. I wish we could spend more time with you, but uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jane.